uh, married and raised a nice family in Texas. So everybody was contributing their help to American and Allied victory. Now the Hello, <coughs> the Hello Girls were an idea that General Pershing came up with. He said, I want female operators, I don't want American Army Signal Corps operators. The female operators took messages from American commanders along the American portion of the trench lines. The American commanders relayed these messages through 200 Hello Girls in a signal building, and they relayed them to Chamon, France, which was Pershing's headquarters. Thousands applied, 200 were hired. Grace Bank was the head or chief operator. To be a Hello Girl, you had to have patience. You had to be calm, and you had to know English, French, and German fluently. And that they did. Now, here's the dirty part of it. After the war, the Army said they were never really part of the U.S. Army, therefore they were not entitled to pensions. So they got the short end of, of the stick, uh, even though they, they contributed. Okay. Uh, yes, well, uh, and then there was the Army Nursing Corps. We had 10,000 white American nurses in the Army Nursing Corps. There were African American nurses, but they were kept stateside. And uh, so we had white nurses over there, but they were well liked by the doughboys. And um, the nurses, uh, with, without them, we couldn't have had rehabilitation of our young men who were at the brink of death. The nurses were traditionally thought of as not being appropriate for a rough soldier. This was the first time thousands were ministering to wounded soldiers in World War I. And uh, the, the nurses learned how to give injections, which they had never given before in prior wars, how to give anesthetics. And one of them, Julius Stimson, who became a major in the US Army, learned in England the principles and practices of physical therapy. And when the war was over, she went back to the United States and became the founder of physical therapy in the USA. So there were several breakthroughs in World War I, and the nurses contributed their fair share. There were also the sky pilots, not fighting fighter pilots, but chaplains. Every company of doughboys had its chaplain. He lived in the trenches with the doughboys. He might die with the doughboys because when they went over the top, the chaplain, unarmed, also went over the top with them. When a doughboy was killed, the chaplain would try to find out his background. He would take his dog tags, and this was the first American war in which American soldiers and Marines had dog tags. And he would keep all the vital information together, and when American graves registration meandered around to that particular unit, he would supply the info. So he truly was a father to the troops, and they would use any kind of pulpit, including a parked aircraft, to speak from between battles. <coughs> Now, motorized transport, yes, was definitely in its infancy. There were 90,000 horses <coughs> used to transport supply wagons in the mers argonne campaign, and only a few hundred of these little motorized vehicles. But this marked the start of motorization gradually eclipsing horse-drawn supply. Eddie Rickenbacker was really Eddie Reichenbacher. He was German-American, and he had to change his name because it wouldn't do to have America's ace of aces well known as a German-American when uh, there was such suspicion at home on the home front. But uh, he was a race car driver and Pershing chauffeur. So I, I don't want to belabor the slides too much because it, it comes rather like a, a slideshow. Um, the Marines were there, they were the devil dogs because the Germans called them that. And in one battle, they captured a group of Germans, another group of Germans attacked, they turned around to fight the second group of attackers, the captured people turned on them. The Americans won the battle even though they were fighting two ways at once. They being in all the original group of Germans except one and they sent him back to tell his buddies they better not mess with the Marines. And so, Tuggle Hooded became an honorary title 
for the United States Marine Corps in France, and this is a great recruiting poster. <laughs> along those lines. Now, there are more slides, but I, I'm sure I'm pushing the envelope time-wise, and uh, so I think at this point, it's, it's best to say that we know who won the war, uh, but we also know who lost the peace. And Woodrow Wilson was, in many respects, a very fine leader, but he wanted the League of Nations, which was his version of the eventual United Nations, to be his baby, and he didn't want any Republican uh, interference as he saw it, and that split the Senate, and when it split the Senate, it never got ratified, and because American armies, furthermore, did not join the Allied armies, which also, furthermore, did not penetrate Germany, since it was an armistice and not an unconditional surrender, the Germans felt they were stabbed in the back, and Wilson helped perpetuate a myth that he and the League of Nations were stabbed in the back. So it was a double stab in the back, and of course, we know that World War II mushroomed out of the unresolved issues of World War I. So that concludes my talk. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, since we have pairs of Johns here, uh, questions? I think we have time for a couple questions. Uh, if I might, I'd like, I'd like to add your comment on the Lafayette. Yes. That uh, squadron still exists. Oh, it does? And it is uh, stationed in the same station was in World War I. And they uh, are constantly fighting with the American airplanes and have done so in Iraq. Oh, really? The Iraq War, the same squadron. The same squadron. They all speak English better than I do, which isn't saying much, but they do an awfully, they're a fine group of pilots. Are there any other, Steve? Uh, a, a question for the other John. Uh, you talk about the Irish and British and, and the relations, in, in their feelings in World War I maybe weren't unanimous. And I've heard stories about some of the Irish supporting the Germans. How strong was that through, throughout uh, Southern Ireland? Yes, yeah, so you probably know that in 1916, the Irish Rebellion happens in the Irish they literally try and get the, the English out of Ireland, right? It's the first uh, effort to really get the English out, right? Uh, from the Irish Catholic perspective, right, Southern Ireland, you can't think of it the way you think of England and Ireland today. A hundred years ago, yeah. can you hear me A hundred years ago, uh, from the perspective of not just the burgeoning IRA, but also many Irish Catholics, uh, it makes perfect sense to ally with anybody who will fight against the British. Remember, we know what happens after World War I, and we know what happens in World War II. You would never know that in 1916. It's perfectly logical. After, what, 400 years of uh, colonization from an Irish perspective, of, uh, of invasion, basically, that yes, we will run guns for the Germans. When I say we, I mean them. Uh, although my grandfather was in there, right? Uh, so it makes perfect sense. Having said that, it's a small minority, right? So numerically, most Irish people, like most populations today, you're not really part of decision making. You don't really read about what's going on. They're not passive or stupid, but they just want peace and stability. It does make sense, and there were some Irish uh, who wanted out. That's ignoring the fact, of course, that Northern Ireland, which is mainly Protestants, is was and is legally part of Great Britain and was fighting with the British. So we're talking about Ireland in the south a small number of, we'd call them radical men, or you might call them rebels, or you might call them heroes, depending on the perspective, or traitors, depending on the perspective. But yeah, there was a government, there was help. Uh, were, there, were there any freedom fighters or traitors in Germany that... Traitors or traitors? Traitors? Yeah. Traitors? Well, that Against the German army? Interesting. Uh, I think it's fair to say that in every country, even Germany, there were people who thought this is insane. While it was leading to war in 1913-12, once it started, and definitely two or three years in by 1917. Uh, so again, a historian will say the choice word traitor is how we look at it, right? 
uh, from a German person's perspective, they might have been the ones that knew wisest back then. Right? Uh, but yeah, I think in every army, it's fair to say. Keep in mind Germany too is fractured between a Protestant North and a Catholic South, and the regions, uh, who just 40 years before, that's the 1970s for us, just 40 years before, hadn't even been unified in the German state. They were competing principalities as, as they have been for since there was German. So yeah, it's complicated, right? It's messy. That said, like I said a moment ago, the mass of German men and their families were patriotic. And although I've spent, I grew up hating Germans, I'll be frank with you, I was trained to hate Germans in the 70s, right? It was very raw still, the war. I can still see the, the remains of it. Uh, but from a German perspective, uh, they're fighting to compete with the British, the Russians, the Americans, and the French. Perfectly logical. That's before you get to Hitler. That's another story. I don't know. What's the... Uh... Go for it. Okay. sabotage their own war efforts? Is that the question? So those few people that actually worked against their own country? Was it futile then in World War I? Uh, it's not for me to judge, really. Uh, I don't think they made much of a dent. Uh, I mean, you don't want to, it's called presentism, you don't want to be thinking about present day versions of that uh, and applying 1916 versions. Uh, they're individuals making individual choices. In communist Russia, there are thousands who want to fight against the state. In every state, there are minorities. Traitors, if you want, sure. Do you want to add to that? You probably know more about that. Yeah, I, I would like to add one thing. I made some handouts, and there are three handouts, and they're stacked on that table. There are those, yes, white handouts. So please take one before you leave. And that's sort of all your questions. Cartooning from the <laughs> 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 But he went over there. He was in the Yeah, he did well in the rest of the He did well 
rest of it just really just <laughs> but going back to the other to what John was saying over here about you cannot tell what the outcome of any event is going to be. And where you know most people think of war being horrific, there are other outcomes that are unpredictable, such as the artistry and the influence of, of culture. And so just to add to John's point there, while agreeing totally with it, many Americans, uh, a lot of families here, right, who didn't have people going to war, minorities and white, right, Catholic families, Jewish families, uh, weren't involved in the war directly, and weren't reading newspapers and watching CNN, right? You could live a separate life in this country, though, very easily. That said, we don't know the numbers, and I'd agree with that comment. Where it affected most Americans, especially by the end of the war, was again in economic growth. This country came out of World War I smiling economically, with all due respect to the soldiers that died. Uh, it's the only country that did so. Uh, Britain and France began a desperate de decline to cling on to Middle Eastern colonies and African colonies, pitiful divisions within the country, and famine in the 30s. This country boomed, and it should be pointed out that there are historians who think industrialists, merchant bankers, and financiers pushed Wilson to war. Which we don't want to hear because it takes away the noble narrative, right? And that's true enough anyway. But there's also a larger picture of this is going to make bank for the country, and it did. But even that doesn't prove that A led to B, that's the basic historical fallacy, right? But there's plenty of evidence. There was a Nike Committee investigation in the 1930s before World War II about were we pushed into war so bankers could get rich, and it was inconclusive, which to me tells you that you don't want a conclusion, but I don't know. So I would like to introduce the next two to you on Saturday at the museum uh, of the San Ramon Valley down the street. Marsha Harmon from Cottage Jewel will be doing a program on sweetheart jewelry in, in time for Valentine's Day. Uh, and when you go see the exhibition at the museum, and I think uh, here as well, you'll run into some sweetheart jewelry from World War I, World War II, uh, Vietnam. Uh, I don't remember anything that we have from the current um, the current era, but Korea as well. So uh, that's Saturday, 10.30 a.m. on the back of this flyer at the museum. And we will reconvene here uh, two weeks from now on February 23rd. Uh, if you're a fan of the PBS series, The American Experience, like I am, uh, they did a program on war letters um, back in 2002, I think it is. Uh, we have the disc and we'll show that program. If you've known me for any length of time, you know I give homework. Uh, and if you're going to come to that program, I would appreciate you do me a favor. You have two weeks. Go through any letters that you have in your family. Read a few of them. And what I would like to talk about after we view this program is what are those, what's the significance of those letters? Why do those letters, whether from the Civil War, World War I, today, why do they speak to us? What do they mean for us? We have letters in the museum, and I've been reading letters now for a couple of years, from people we don't know. But yet there's a resonance to those letters when you read them. There's a common human experience there. And I think I'd like to have you look back through what you have at home, read a few of those, and come ready to talk about it after the <coughs> four letters next time. Thank you for coming tonight. I would not be a good director if I didn't suggest that there are a couple donation jars up here. Uh, so I'm hoping that you'll make use of those. It is still raining out there. Please be careful going home. And once again, thank you for coming out. John, John, thank you.